Welcome to ProSource Athletics College Recruiting Seminar. Um, I am Brandon Agamononi, founder and president of ProSource Athletics. Um, we appreciate you guys being here today. Uh, I want to take a minute and introduce uh, our expert panel up here that's going to help you guys in your process of uh, the college on uh, your route to uh, college. First, we have Kyle Abbott to my left, um, former Division Three, not Juco, former Division Three player. Uh, Division one player, first round draft pick for the uh, California Angels. That's how old he is. Um, and um, is, is now uh, one of my partners in ProSource and um, was a major league pitcher for uh, five seasons with the Angels and the um, Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, we have also Luke Carlin, who is a former Division one player and um, now a current major league catcher for the Cleveland Indians, has some time with uh, both the Padres and the Twins? Diamondbacks. Diamondbacks, I always get that messed up. Arizona Diamondbacks and the uh, and, uh, Padres. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I want to talk about today is three core pursuits um, when you're looking at college recruiting. Uh, first and foremost, you want to go in remembering that you're a student athlete, not an athlete student. Okay, that seems to be missed a lot in our culture today. Um, but first and foremost, the number one question people ask us with colleges or with pro scouts, what kind of student is he? What kind of grades does he get? They want to know that you're going to be able to handle things when you get away from home, away from your family. You get into that environment where you have a lot of free time and that you are focused on your academics because guess what? If you can't keep your grades up, you don't play in college. That's how that works. So um, student athlete number one. And so when you go into college, you wanna, you wanna consider the academic requirements of that university or of that college. You also wanna consider um, what, how they might be able to help you. So for instance, uh, I was uh, from the university or went to the University of Maryland I, uh, I played there for four years and got my degree in communication uh, in 1998. And when I was there as a freshman, they actually required us to go to a freshman uh, class, if you will, for I believe it was three hours every week where they helped with your academics, make sure your homework's done. They have tutors there, subjects that may be difficult for you, um, that sort of thing. So it's very important to consider how that university might be able to support you as you're making a transition from you know, 17 or 18 year old young man, young woman, um, heading into college athletics. Um, as far as my background goes and some of my considerations, I was a, um, uh, an All-American as a baseball player in high school, uh, as, an, as a uh, pitcher and as an outfielder. And so my route to uh, college looked a little bit different than some people's. I had several major universities that were recruiting me and um, I really didn't know what to do. I had no guidance. I had nobody there to really tell me, hey, you need to do this, you need to do that. Um, but what I did have was my high school baseball coach was very proactive on my behalf. So he really went out and um, said, hey, you know, this guy's pitching this day or this guy's playing, you know, I'd love to have you come see him play. And then from there, it was my parents and I's responsibility to follow up with the colleges, to follow up with the universities that we were interested in attending. And at that point, um, that's where it got serious. So we started looking at financial considerations. Um, could we afford to go to the school that I wanted to go to? In my case, I was looking at schools like University of Maryland, Clemson, um, University of Miami, University of Minnesota, UNC Greensboro down in, in North Carolina, um, some schools around the Washington DC area, George Washington University, things like that. So. Um, when it came down to the athletic scholarships, I had to weigh kind of what it looked like. Clemson wasn't offering a whole lot, but I really liked Clemson's baseball program. Maryland was offering a lot more. Um, University of Miami wasn't offering a whole lot. George Washington University was offering a ton, and I loved the academics of George Washington University, but I really didn't like their baseball program as far as where I thought I ultimately wanted to go. and. Um, and into professional athletics. So that was a consideration for me as well. And uh, the coach at GW was great. He was great through the whole process, but it just academically um, and athletically and the student life, which is another aspect that you need to consider, is, is just something that I, I wasn't um, too keen on. So ultimately I chose the University of Maryland. And one of the core reasons why I chose University of Maryland, um, people say, well, it was close to home. I said, yeah, it was, it was nice being close to home, but 
my high school coach said to me, and I think this is something I want to get across to each of you, is he said, where are you going to be happiest at if baseball ends today? And so some of the people who are going to hear this, you know, most of the people in this room are, are baseball background, but this is really for uh, football players, for basketball players, for volleyball players. Anywhere you go, where are you going to be happiest at if that sport were to be cut short in your college pursuit through injury, through maybe you don't perform in the way that you're uh, capable of performing and your scholarship, scholarship gets cut, those are things to consider. Um, and so you want to make sure that the student life, the academics that you're hoping to, the degree, engineering, um, you know, landscape, maintenance, whatever it might be, you know, is available to you guys to be able to pursue and that you enjoy your time at college with or without the sport that you play. Um, and so those are really the three core pursuits, academics, athletic environment, and then the student life. Um, those are the things that you really want to take a hard look at when you're considering uh, the college that you go to. Um, next up, what I want to, who I want to introduce you to is um, Kyle Abbott. As I mentioned, former Division Three player, uh, Division One player, and then a first round draft pick. And uh, he'll give you a little bit more background on his story and we'll go from there. Kyle Abbott. Hi guys. Um, yeah, I have kind of an interesting background, um, uh, especially with where my um, baseball career took me. When I was uh, the age of you guys, high school guys, uh, I was actually a water polo player. And um, I have to remind people from Texas all the time that no, the horses do not get in the pool with us. So, But um, as a matter of fact, I got, had an opportunity to um, try out for the Junior Olympic team. Uh, I was an All-American my senior year as a water polo player, and um, actually I didn't see baseball being really in my future until very, very late in my high school career. Um, but uh, one of the things that I want to talk to you guys about is a, a proactive versus a reactive approach to your college recruiting process. Um, I had success in water polo. Um, like I said, I was playing in big tournaments. I was getting to try out for the Junior Olympic team, and I thought, you know, the college coaches are going to find me, um, you know, or my high school coaches are the ones doing it. Well, your high school coach's responsibility is not to provide your college scholarship, right? He may get calls, he may get letters from schools, uh, which he'll pass along to you, but his job is not to go out and do uh, your college recruiting. That's your job, your responsibility. And as a result, despite the fact that I had this very, very successful water polo career, um, I only had one or two schools that were looking at me. Um, and so uh, one of the things I want to tell you guys is, is probably the most important thing you can do is get, get the information that you need prepared in advance. Um, have things like your SAT scores. If you're not a good test taker, go and take an SAT program, right? Just get ready to take that test because every school is going to want an SAT or an ACT. Um, particularly the Ivy League schools, they're SAT uh, only. Uh, but if you're not a good test taker, find a way to get a better score on that SAT score because um, a lot of times what happens, uh, and this kind of goes into your proactive reactive approach, is, is schools only have a certain amount of money that they can give to you, right? Um, for instance, we took our 17-year-old team this fall to California for a tournament, and we were fortunate enough to have the uh, college recruiting coaches, uh, typically in baseball, each, each of the bigger colleges will have um, uh, one coach whose responsibility is to uh, recruit. And uh, a couple buddies of mine came out and talked to us, one from UCI and one from Cal State Fullerton. And one of the things that, that they were telling us is uh, your test scores are, are hugely important. It's one of the first things they ask for. But one of the other things they said is, hey, you guys are from Texas, this is a California school, we only get one out-of-state scholarship. And so it's going to be the person that's most, um, uh, that has the best credentials that's going to be able to get that. It's the kid that they think is going to have the best um, baseball skills, yes, but also what are his SAT scores, what are his grades like, and because that way they can get you uh, financial aid for your academics as well. The other aspect, I think, of uh, a proactive approach is to go out and contact schools. And in order to do that, you have to make your list of schools. Um, one of the things that we did last year was we had asked some of our older high school players to give us a list of schools where they would like to go. 
Um, and uh, the feedback that we got was probably the worst feedback I've ever received. And that is basically what these guys did is they went to Baseball America, they took the top 25 schools in the country, the Division I programs, and they wrote down those schools. And unfortunately, the pro source, we have two 17-year-old teams that are juniors, one 18, one 18 U team. All the guys on the 18 and 17 U team won't go be playing in the Southeastern Conference. As much as we'd love that to happen, it's, it's not going to. Um, and so one of the things that it's, it's paramount as far as being proactive in your approach to your college recruiting is go out and look for schools where, you know what, it, am I going to get an opportunity to play? Yeah, everybody would like to go and play at South Carolina or, or LSU or Texas, right? But not everybody's going to get that opportunity. And so as you start to look around, look at things like who's the college coach? Uh, what kind of program do they have? What conference do they play in? Right? If your goals are maybe to play beyond that level, am I going to have an opportunity to be seen by the people that I need to be seen by? So I kind of introduced you to my, my college recruiting process as a water polo player, but um, very late in my senior year of high school, um, I had some success. And um, I was telling Aggie this, we were talking about it. Uh, Aggie was an All-American as a junior and senior, right? Um, my job as a junior and senior, I was a left-handed pitcher on my team, but my job in high school was to go over the fence and wait for home run balls and make sure that all the balls got thrown back in. All right? As a junior and senior in high school, that was, that was my job. I got to pitch a little bit, but for the most part, I was just an extra player. So um, I always had a lot of confidence in my abilities. I, you know, that, that was one of the things that, that really carried me. Uh, my dad kind of instilled that in me. but. Um, late in my senior year, uh, we had two juniors who actually pitched in front of me who got in trouble. One was drinking at a school function and the other one was inel ineligible because of grades. And so we go into the state playoffs uh, in California and guess who had to throw a majority of the games? Um, I was fortunate enough that uh, I pitched pretty well and I had some junior college coaches come up and say, you know what, if you'd like to, um, you know, we'd like to have you come and play for us. Um, I was a really good student. I was National Honor Society. Um, I think my SAT score was around 1490 out of 1600. Um, you know, I got accepted into Brown, was one of the schools that, that I was actually considering playing water polo at. So um, I knew for me, at junior, uh, junior college was not going to be the route I wanted to go because the academics was important. And my uh, kind of my academic goal was to uh, be an orthopedic surgeon and play Olympic water polo, believe it or not. But Late in my senior year of high school, I said, you know what, I can play college baseball. And so uh, I had already decided that I was going to go to UC San Diego. Um, I had already talked to the water polo coach. He was ready for me to come down there and play for them. Uh, but one of the things about UC San Diego is despite the fact that it's a pretty big school, it's a Division three school. Does everybody know what it means to be Division three versus Division two versus Division one? Division three basically means, or, or foundationally means no scholarships, right? So the players that play at a Division three school do not play for a scholarship. Um, so I went down there, it's, a, it's obviously smaller, although the Division three team that I played on at UC San Diego, we had two players that played in the major leagues, and I don't think we lost to a Division one team in California that, that year. We beat the University of Iowa, we beat San Diego State, we beat some legitimate programs. And so it doesn't mean that the school's any less, it just means that the kids that are going there are generally probably second or third tier um, athletes that are playing without getting scholarships. And so for me, the route wasn't a Division I school because basically as a kid sitting over the fence grabbing home run balls, I wasn't getting a whole lot of recruiting, right? I wasn't getting a whole lot of opportunities. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to say to you guys is, you know what, if, if your dream and your goal is to play baseball at, at the collegiate level or even the professional level, I'm your poster child, right? That was my goal. My goal was to play in the big leagues. As a junior and senior, yeah, I was on the team, but I was basically just an extra. And I kept believing in myself. I kept doing the things that I needed to do, right? I got an opportunity to play in college just because I worked hard at it and because I continued to believe. And then all of a sudden, it, it kind of panned out, um, where from Division three program, I got an opportunity to go to Long Beach State. And from there, you know, we, we basically shocked the world the year before I was there. They were 15 and 40, and when I was there, we were 50 and 15 and went to the uh, College World Series. And then all of a sudden, I'm a first round draft pick. So things like that can happen. But the biggest thing is 
what's your approach to going to school, right? If you're not proactive, if things are happening to you, then you have no control over it, right? So if I had it to go back and do over again, I might be standing up here talking to you as a former water polo player. But if I, had I been proactive, I would have had a lot more opportunities to pick some of the schools where I wanted to go, but because I was sitting there waiting on them, right? When are they gonna contact me? When are they gonna contact me? Well, they're not if you don't go out. Um, I would say if you guys don't know where to start looking, ask us, we're resources for you, right? Just send us an email, say, hey, I'm interested in some of the schools in the area and here's some of the schools, do you know anybody there? Um, just the group of guys that you have with ProSource Athletics between me and, and Daniel Ortmeyer and Aggie and, and Luke, we know a great deal of coaches around the country. And so if you want to know, hey, what's the coach like? What's the program like? Is this a place where, where I'd have some success? We'll let you know and we'll steer you straight. But probably the most important thing is um, as you're looking, right, to be proactive, am I going to get to play as a freshman? Right? Like I said, everybody would like to go to LSU or South Carolina or Texas. But the issue is if you go to Texas, right, are you going to sit on the bench for your first, first two years and not get to play until you're a junior? Because if that happens, you've wasted two years. Because especially in the sport of baseball, it's all about reps. The more reps that you can take, the better your skills get, the more opportunities you have to play against other people, the better you're going to be. Right? And so for some of you guys, it may be choosing a junior college route. For some of you guys, it may be picking us, you know, there's a pretty good Division III program right down the road, Southwestern. Um, it's a great academic school, and they have a good Division III baseball program, you know? And so make sure you have a good balance of, of what you want to do. And just as Aggie said, in your proactive approach, make sure that you are focusing on what if baseball doesn't pan out? Will I still get a good education? All right, so next up is Luke Carlin. He's going to talk to you about Canadian things. All right, uh, my story is a little bit different. Uh, as Kyle pointed out, I grew up in Canada, and so just realized that Johnny here played in the CFL. It's, I'll have to talk to him about that later. Three downs, not right. four, not four. All right. So uh, a little bit about myself, um, and I'm going to touch on some of the things that have already been said, especially uh, academically. Um, I grew up in Canada. Uh, in high school, uh, I played five sports. And I think that uh, in a little bit I'll talk about that, but I think that that's important as well. Um, that, you know, Kyle's route was through, you know, water polo at first. And, and I think that it's important as a, to be an athlete. And w when we talk about student athletes, wh what exactly does that mean? So growing up in Canada, uh, we didn't have high school baseball. So I played uh, similar to what ProSource offers. Uh, certainly not the caliber that uh, it is here. There was one team to play for, and there was about, uh, I don't know, 600,000 people that had to, you know, that they drew from to play for this one team. So uh, a tryout for me lasted weeks, and it was, you know, several hundred kids trying out for one team. Um, so if you were any good, you made it. If you weren't, try hockey or something. So um, I think from uh, that point of view, I definitely had a reactive uh, path to my college career. Um, and, I, and I really wish that I would have known some of the stuff that uh, we're going to cover here today. Uh, I went on, uh, I played for a, uh, that travel team in, in Canada. We played throughout the United States, uh, played some really good teams, a lot of club teams like ProSource. We played uh, several teams like that. Um, I played for uh, the Canadian national team. Uh, it's not really a big feat when there's not a whole lot of players in Canada playing baseball. It's bigger now, but it certainly wasn't huge uh, at that time. And so the avenues of being seen at the amateur level were there for me. Uh, I was gifted in baseball, and uh, I wanted to be uh, a Major League Baseball player since I was three or four years old, so as far as I can remember anyway. So that was always driven in my mind. Um, from there, uh, some of the colleges that we played against, I, you know, they would talk to me after 
and it were the questions, hey, what, what did you get on your SATs? I didn't even know what an SAT was. Um, I was like, I don't know. I don't even know what that is. So that was part of the reactive thing to it. Uh, and then from there, it became, uh, I had several options, some uh, out in this side of the country that I had never been to. And then uh, I ended up attending Northeastern University. It's in Boston. Uh, good academic school. Uh, not so much uh, a big baseball program, but it was in Boston. I grew up a Sox fan. I was, you know, closer to home. So when we talk about uh, what colleges to look for, um, we, we start to go into academics and that was always important to me. I did well in school. Um, once I found out that I had to take an SAT, I had to learn about it. I had to be, uh, it was a, re a reaction to it, but I then began to say, okay, I have to take this. Uh, how do I take it? Who do I need to talk to? Um, you know, there's classes that were available uh, to do that, so I think that that's important. Obviously, uh, most of us in here already already kind of know that, but um, to touch on what was said, I knew that one, if I broke my leg and never played another day of baseball, like Aggie was saying, where would I want to end up? And so I chose a good academic school uh, for two reasons. One, I was gonna play every day as a freshman. And two, I knew that um, if I never played another day of baseball, I would have a good education behind me. And so I think that when you start to uh, pick your schools, have an idea of, for one, what do you want to do besides play baseball or whatever other sport that you're interested in, um, and choose that route first and then kind of see, you know, hey, do they have a good baseball program as well? I think that um, if you were to look at the pure numbers, and I, I don't wanna say this to discourage anybody, but uh, the amount of people that have the dream of playing major league or collegiate baseball or whatever is very, very few um, that get to the top. So I think that academics is by far the most important thing. And, I, and I, I'm glad that uh, I am where I am today and I, I feel blessed, but at the same time, um, I'm not, I haven't finished my degree. I was drafted as a junior and so that is something that, um, you know, I need to pursue as well. Um, so, like I said, choose the academic route first. That would be my personal suggestion. Um, know what the requirements are to get into that school. Set your goals. Um, and be disciplined about it. I think that um, some things that we've all, you know, that Aggie and Kyle have touched on already is that um, you need to be disciplined. It has to be a way of life for you as far as your academics are concerned. If you're disciplined in that area, you will be disciplined in other areas of your life. And from my personal experience, seeing guys that have had success at the major league level or even at the collegiate level, you just don't walk into something like that. And I think that um, if I can instill that on this audience, uh, the reason why we've succeeded is because we've worked our butt off to get here. And I was not as gifted as some of the people we have in this room right now, but I worked harder at it than everybody else around me. And I think that um, from every facet of the game of my life, whether it was academically, you know, in the weight room with swings or catching or, you know, nutrition, uh, some of that stuff I'm going to talk about, I wanted to outwork everybody. Um, which brings us into uh, a sense of urgency that I want to also instill on you guys is that the work that you put in now, as far as academically, physically, it will benefit you down the road. I took for granted some of the things that we're talking about right now, and 
if you know hindsight's 2020, but I think that if you could do what you can do right now, the road will be much easier for you. Um, so academically, obviously, we talked SATs, find out what the scholarship requirements are. From a financial standpoint, do your homework. Uh, find out what grants are available, you know, your income, all that stuff, uh, especially as parents, find out all that stuff. Talk to us afterwards. We've been down the road. We know the resources. Um, I think that's all I'll say about that academic side of things. As far as weight training is concerned, I think that uh, for the audience here, it's more baseball specific. I will talk about that, that know what you're doing. Know that it's um, sports specific. So for instance, if you're playing baseball and you're working out with a football player, you're not doing the right stuff. Um, everything that we do in baseball is movements. So isolating muscle groups does nothing for you, okay? It makes you look good, and that's about it. So forget the beach bodies. Understand what's important. Your legs, your core, uh, your back, shoulders, elbows, forearms, all that stuff that's baseball specific, that's the way you need to go. Again, between us up here, uh, we can help you with that. Ask questions. Um, I'm certainly not a personal trainer, but I can tell you that I've gone into spring training at 210 pounds. Uh, today I'm 188. I broke down and hurt myself two months into the season because I wanted to be bigger and stronger than everybody else, and that's not what you need to do to play baseball. Um, also, um, you have to understand what kind of player you are, so it's position specific. Uh, pitchers will be doing something different than you know, outfielders, catchers, infielders. Uh, again, we would love to help you with any of that stuff. Just be smart about it, use the resources, um, understand that it is, baseball is a marathon. Um, it's, it may not seem like that, but if it's in your future, uh, it's a grind, so you want to train like one. Uh, as far as athletics are concerned, obviously, uh, by your presence here tonight, you're showing that you know this might be in your future. Know your trade. So uh, whether it's hitting or pitching or you know defense, you need to work at it, and you need to. Use the people around you, use the resources, find out what makes you successful. So when you go on to college, you know, you're gonna have new eyes, new people talking at you. You know what kind of player you are already uh, so that you can discern between this might help me, this might not. I think that that's uh, extremely important that uh, especially, you know, at, at ProSource, you know, I know how Kyle teaches, I know how Aggie teaches, and myself, we try to teach you so that you can teach yourself. And I'm not saying that, you know, we know everything or that you're going to know everything, but at the same time, know what makes, what's the path to success. Know what's going to make you successful. Um, from a nutritional standpoint, um, this is an area which, I wish I was a little more disciplined in, uh, especially younger. Not only is nutrition fuel for your body, uh, it's fuel for your mind. So from an academic standpoint, know, you know that you're eating junk food and you're staying up late for your exam, you're probably not going to perform. Uh, it goes the same in the classroom to on the field. Know what you need to be eating in the morning, during, after, uh, and know how that affects you. So I, I, I'm not a nutritionist, but I can tell you from experience, I have uh, a plan that I follow. I know how I feel on certain days when I eat certain things, and I, I use that to my advantage. And 
if you guys are blessed enough to play at the college level or even at the, at the pro level, you will have these things, uh, these resources readily available to you. Take advantage of them. And I think that um, in conclusion, I cannot stress enough that whether it was from an academic, financial, athletic, you know, nutritional area, I did not have the people around me to help me. And I think that that's one of the reasons why I agreed to do this tonight is that I just wish I had the resources that are available um, to you guys. And if it's in your future, if it's what you want, use them. Use your head. And uh, that's all I got. Thanks. Oh, Miss Johnny. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so um, obviously we've heard a lot of different uh, information here today, very, very useful information today. Things that are going to help each of you as you go forward in your recruiting process, whether that's as a baseball player, volleyball player, soccer player, whatever it might be. Um, everybody has a different process. Um, and route that they're going to go through. And one of the things I want to touch on, I, we, I talked a little bit about my own personal recruiting process, but I want to give you a little bit more in depth uh, to help you kind of understand what it took to get where I wanted to be. Um, as Kyle mentioned, yes, I was an All-American uh, baseball player in high school. I did play other sports, but just honestly wasn't as good. And so um, when it came to looking at colleges, I, I wanted to go somewhere that had a great um, academic program, as I mentioned, I want to have a um, good athletic program, had good coaches, all that type of, all those type of uh, factors were involved in my decision. And so <clears throat> when I started going through this process, I said, well, when does this all start? You know, well, for me, it started when I was about ninth grade. And so um, for each of you that's going into high school, that's when colleges really start looking at your academics is when you're in your ninth grade year. You hear about some of these schools out there that are signing kids that are in seventh and eighth grade to, you know, for future uh, scholarships in football and different sports like that. But for me, it started in about ninth grade. And what that meant is that I knew they were going to pull my transcripts um, when I was a senior. And so I wanted to make sure that academically I did a good job of, um, you know, taking care of business in the classroom. I didn't do as good a job as I should have. I'll just be upfront with you. Um, I, my focus back then was baseball. And so if something would have happened to me during my high school career, I probably wouldn't have, have gone to the same or been able to look at the same type of colleges um, that I had the opportunity to go to uh, because my academics just weren't up to the standards that they should have been. A lot of people that I run across nowadays, uh, particularly in the North Texas area and some of the people we deal with, the pro source have unbelievable academics. And so um, that's a great start. But that needs to start as soon as possible. It needs to start in ninth grade um, and making sure that you're taking care of that, that business. Um, when I went into um, or started going to college, what I had to look at is, as I mentioned, you know, I was looking at Maryland, I'm looking at Clemson, I'm looking at all these things. But what I didn't mention is that I was also looking at some junior colleges. And the reason for that was uh, one of the schools that I was really interested in going to was Florida State University. Um, they had a feeder school, Tallahassee Community College, that was a very good baseball program um, down there in Tallahassee, right next to, the, to uh, the campus at Florida State. And they offered me a great scholarship. I was going to be going there for about 500 bucks a year, everything else taken care of, including dorm, the whole nine yards. Um, food, even, was taken care of. So, you know, that was a consideration for me, even though I had all the opportunities to go Division I. I also looked at going the JUCO route because I said, well, what if I go to you know, TCC for a year, then I could potentially jump to Florida State at the end of that if I wanted to. Um, ultimately, I didn't choose that, but I did want to make sure I mentioned that in the course of this discussion so that some of you guys sitting out there saying, man, you know, I don't have the opportunity to go D1. I, you know, nobody's even looking at me, nobody's doing all this stuff. There are d different routes for everybody to where you want to get. Um, and so, one of the things that I took it upon myself to do was do research. You know, all you guys out there sitting out there have these Facebook accounts, have all these things that I, you know, see updates on, you know, Farmville or whatever might have happened or this person tagged you in a photo. You know what? Spend an hour, spend an hour and a half, find out about the programs you want to go to. Don't rely on the people around you to tell you. Go find out yourself. When you're on Facebook, open up another tab. 
and go look at the University of whatever it might be, or go look at this junior college in this area where you might have heard about. Find out about the coach's background. Find out about the program. Find out if they have the academics that you're looking for, the major that you're looking for. Find out if they have the student life that you're looking for. Um, so I want you to utilize the resources that you have available. We didn't have the internet in the same way when I was looking uh, to go to college. So I didn't have those type of opportunities. Um, one of the other things I want to touch on is um, putting the emphasis in the right place. So we've got an individual up here in Johnny Quinn. We've got these resources out here who are willing to help you for minimal investment, okay? But a, but a very important investment. Well, all the time, particularly as it relates to baseball, since that's our focus, is we have people that come in and say, hey, do you know anything about these new bats? I'm thinking about spending $452 on a bat. I'm thinking about spending you know, $350 on a glove, or I want to get these spikes that have air in them so that I can run faster. And I go, okay, um, I have an idea. How about you spend um, $150 on a glove, you spend uh, 175 on the bat and you spend 60 on the cleats and whatever you save go get a video done for your college recruiting process go spend the time spend the effort spend the hour or whatever it takes to go get that done so that then you can have your own link have your own website have your own video that you can send and profile yourself to these colleges um, what we're really talking about here is ownership take ownership in your own careers and so leading back to my own process. Um, this different example um, as far as the process goes, but the, the same rule applies. When I wanted to go into professional baseball, I was already at the University of Maryland and I sat down with my coaches at the time and I said, hey, I'd really like to go play in the Cape Cod League, which at the time and probably still is the most elite uh, summer college league that you can play in for, for baseball. And they said, no, we're not going to recommend that you go to the Cape Cod League. We want you to go play in this league called the Valley League. Valley League was an excellent league, too. It just wasn't where I thought that I was going to be able to profile myself the best. And so they said, we're, we're really not going to help you do that. We've got relationships in the Valley League. We want to, we want to um, utilize those resources. But I was dead set on going to the Cape Cod League. So we didn't have you know, Facebook and this thing and links that I could do and all this other stuff. And so what I did is I took it upon myself one evening is I sat down and I wrote eight letters. Well, I wrote one letter and made eight copies. And I sent it to all the teams in the Cape Cod League. And I said, here's who I am. Here's my resources. Or here are some references that you can check on me about. College coach, pro scout, on and on. Um, and I'd like to come try out for your team. I got two responses. And the first team responded back, thanks, but no thanks. Totally fine. I was totally cool with that. I just want to know that I took ownership of my career and put myself in the best possible situation to succeed. And that's really what we're talking about today. The second one said, you know what? We'd like to have you come try out. I said, okay, awesome. When? And they said, next week or whatever it was. And I said, all right. So I live in Maryland, drove up to Cape Cod, Massachusetts in Wareham, Massachusetts. And they told me going in, they said, we have um, one spot available for a pitcher and you're vying for that spot with one other person who has, uh, might go sign with the USA national team. And so I said, so let me get this straight. I'm gonna drive up there for eight and a half, nine hours, and I'm gonna come have this tryout for what might be, you know, 30 minutes. And, but you already might have the spots filled when I get up there. Yes. Okay, I'm in. So I go up there and drive all the way up there and, um, and I get out of the car and I, I meet um, the pitching coach at the time was a gentleman named Joe Walsh, who's now the head coach at Harvard. He gets out, he's got the thick Boston accent, love Coach Walsh, and he says, Aggie, we're going to have you pitch. I said, all right, great. He said, you got four innings to show us what you got. Awesome. So I went out there and uh, pitched four innings. I threw four shutout innings, fortunately enough. And during the time when I was going out there, they actually got a phone call from the kid who was supposed to come play with them if he didn't sign with the national team. Guess what? He signed with the national team. So I come off the field, I'm sweaty, I'm smelly, I'm whatever, you know. They're like patting me on the back, hey, great job. I said, oh, by the way, we want you to sign your contract. You're going to be playing with Wareham Gaiman this summer for the, um, in the Cape Cod League. Do you think I was ecstatic? Do you think I cared about the nine-hour drive anymore after that? Do you think I was pretty pleased with myself after the fact that I wrote all those letters and sent them up there? Absolutely. So carry that a step further. 
So now I'm in this elite Cape Cod League, and I'm surrounded by the likes of Jerry Hairston Jr. and Carlos Pena and Barry Zito, Mark Mulder, on and on and on, right? And I'm playing against the best of the best of the best. So that means that pro scouts were there to watch me play, okay? Even if they really weren't there to watch me play, they got to see me play. And so I, go, I end up having a great summer, um, go back to University of Maryland as a senior and get drafted as a senior. Um, but the point of that whole story, obviously, that wasn't related to college, but it was related to ownership, taking ownership of your career, making sure that you do the things that you need to do on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, to put yourself in a situation to succeed. That's all it's about. And so that process, as I mentioned, starts in ninth grade. You've got to get after it. You've got to get after it academically. You've got to get after it athletically. You've got to get after it um, in every way that you possibly can because it carries over to every single aspect of your life. Which brings me to the next um, thing, the routes. Okay, so each, each of these people in this room has had a different route to where they wanted to go, but they've all gotten there. Well, how in the world did a kid from Canada get to the major leagues? He didn't even have a high school team to play on. And how did a tall, lanky kid from Southern California who was a water polo player get to where he wanted to be? How did a high school American go from this port to that spot or whatever to get where he wanted to be? And Johnny and his story, you know, and going from that, um, not even being recruited, to going and playing in the NFL and the CFL and now on the U.S. bobsled team, okay? They took it upon themselves. They took ownership of their careers. Parents, you play a huge part in that play a huge part in that, okay? So I get calls all the time saying, hey, who did you send my um, information to? Who did you send my video to? And my response is, who did you send it to? Okay, that's the important factor here. I can do it all day long. Sure, we have relationships. Sure, we have people that we know that we can call, and we do that. We're very proactive on our side with ProSource doing that. John is very proactive on his side with the Athlete Watch doing that, okay? But if you're not willing to take ownership of your own career, then don't expect us to, right? It's not my college scholarship that's on the line. It's yours. It's yours. So figure out what you want and go get it, period. Um, the route is gonna look different from, for everyone. Some of you people in this room have not made your um, high school teams. Who cares? Who cares, okay? Because everybody develops at a different time. Everybody develops differently. Kyle was tall and thin and lanky and, you know, was fetching home run balls. And six or seven years later, he's a major league pitcher, okay? Some of you guys in this room might be smaller than other kids. Some of you guys have already tapped out your potential and are as big as you're gonna get, okay? But sports doesn't end, you know? So you, get, you gotta keep working at your craft, keep getting better and better and better. And so that takes me to my next point, which is player versus prospect, okay? This is tough for some of you guys to understand, and I get a lot of phone calls about this, so I want to make sure I address it. I was a player. I was not a prospect. I was a very good baseball player, an All-American, okay? I was the, um, one of the top 50 baseball players that's voted on by whoever votes on that in the country my senior year, okay? Gatorade said I was one of the top 50 players in the, in the nation my senior year. I was one of the top 10 players on the East Coast my senior year. Um, how come I wasn't drafted? I don't understand. How come every school in the country wasn't knocking down my door to give me a college scholarship? I don't understand, because I wasn't a prospect. I was six foot one and 150 pounds. That doesn't project out very well, okay? But Kyle, six foot four, you know, maybe he was 175 pounds. That projects out, well, he's left-handed, he's tall. You have to understand what these people are looking at, okay? I'll talk specifically on baseball. In baseball, you're graded on five physical tools. Um, and those physical tools are hitting for average, hitting for power, defense, running speed, and arm strength, okay? And then you have the intangibles, the academics, the um, attitude, the how you are as a teammate, all those type of things play into that. But from a projectability standpoint, I didn't project out well in my five physical tools. I could throw a ball well and had good control, but that's about it. Had a little speed, but okay, well, what's that gonna help me on? Covering first base better as a pitcher, okay? So you have to understand how these people are looking at you. Kyle, though, tall, lanky, left-handed kid with huge upside potential, they liked that. They liked it enough to give him a first round, to make him a first round pick out of Long Beach State, okay? This is what these people are looking at. So when you're sitting there evaluating yourself against your high school teammate, maybe that high school teammate isn't very good at all as a player, but they're an excellent prospect in these college coaches and pro scouts' mind, okay? So now, 
The thing is, how do you fulfill that potential? Okay, that comes down to the player individually. So maybe you have a prospect who will always be a prospect. And you, and you see that all the time. I saw that a lot in pro ball. You saw guys who threw 96 miles per hour with unbelievable breaking balls who never saw the light of day and never got out of A ball. But then you saw some guys who could really play. Um, teammate of mine, Jamie Carroll, phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, I think he's been playing 10 years now in the big leagues. He was almost out of the game, uh, I think it was 2002, because he just couldn't get a break. He was a great player, but not a prospect. He's not very tall, not very strong, not very big, but he did everything on the field well and finally got his break, and he's made the most of it, okay? So you have to understand what coaches and scouts are looking at. If you're that tall, lanky kid who can throw the ball pretty well, but maybe you don't have a whole lot of accuracy, you don't have a whole lot of movement on the ball, whatever, those are um, some intangibles that you can learn, but you gotta develop them. Just like we're talking about, you know, off the field, you have to develop the intangibles, the gifts you've been given. You might be up against a guy that's batting 400, but he's three foot six, you know, and doesn't run very fast, but he can hit. Well, guess what? You're probably a better prospect than that kid, okay? That's okay, it's part of it. Everybody's got an opportunity. There, um, my numbers might be a little off here, but I think there's over 1,800 programs in the country that play baseball, 1,800. Go find where you wanna play and go play it. Football, it's a little different, but there's more scholarship opportunities, you know? Title IX with women's athletics, very important. They can go pretty much anywhere and, and, and have a scholarship offered to them. Um, so it depends on what your background is, depending on what sport you're playing, but the process needs to be the same. That's a proactive ownership role in your own career and as a parent. It's your son, it's not my son. I'd love for your son to go play at a Division I school. I'd love for all, everybody in this room and everybody who's going to be watching this to go play Division I athletics or to go play college somewhere, have a wonderful career, and go play in the NFL or the NHL or the NBA or whatever it might be. It's just not going to happen. But there are opportunities for you to extend your playing career and extend and get an outstanding education along the way. Um, so with that being said, I just want to um, say thank you to all of you for attending today. I want to uh, thank Kyle and Luke and Johnny. Uh, we're getting ready to open this up for a question and answer. So hopefully you guys have been writing down some questions. And then if you have anyone in particular you want to target to, just ask them. It's fine. It's just going to be an open forum. And then um, we'll get you guys out here. So thank you.